Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Morning Light with Russ and Kitty Walden. This is a Bible study, chapter by chapter, from Genesis on, and we're in 1 Kings, where we give you your whole Bible back. It's kind of fun how God has orchestrated this to, to be the narrative that drives our life, and how often we connect with the scriptures, even for the day and the week we're living in. It's it's exciting, and it's, uh, you know, he said it was profitable for instruction, for correction, for rebuke, even if we needed it, <laughs> if we need it, and um, so we could be perfect and thoroughly furnished, and I don't know about you, but I want to be that, and I want to grow up to that perfection that is Christ. Amen, honey bunny? <laughs> Amen. We're looking at First Kings 6 today. You have an oracle in your temple. We know that the New Testament tells us we are the temple of God. And in this chapter, we're going to see that the Holy of Holies is called throughout this chapter by another name. It's called the Oracle, which implies it's that which we consult to get the mind of God. Amen. It, it, there is an inward Oracle. We have outward oracles. The Bible tells, uh, the New Testament says that a prophet is supposed to speak as the oracle of God. No mm -hmm. ifs, ands, maybes, perhaps, I feel like, mm -hmm. not too sure. Oh, no. You are to speak as the oracle of God or be quiet. Amen. But know this, that the oracle without does not supersede the oracle within. Mm -hmm. If you're not hearing the oracle within, uh, then the purpose of the outward oracle of the prophetic is to turn you to that inward resource. Thank you, Lord. In this chapter, Solomon finishes the temple. There are many types and shadows in the construction of Solomon's temple, and they all point to who Jesus is on the inside of you. The holiest place, again, where the Ark rested, the Ark of the Covenant, is called the Oracle. And it is a type of your heart. Your heart. See, you are body, soul, and spirit. The temple was outer court, inner court, holy place, holiest place. Your spirit. Uh, your heart, again, is the first Oracle you should consult when you are inquiring of the Lord. Uh, we don't teach that. Because as a rule in Christian culture, we want people to be outwardly dependent and not inwardly dependent on who God is in you. Right. I'm so glad that Paul didn't say in Colossians 1.26 that the gospel he was contending for, that he was in jeopardy for every hour, was Christ in the infrastructure of the Christian religion. Mm -hmm. But he didn't say that. He said the gospel he preached was Christ in you the hope of glory. Christ in me, Christ in your pastor, Christ in your church, Christ in the latest book that's coming down the pike in the Christian uh, literature industry, that is not your hope of glory. Your hope is not in doctrine. Your hope is not in theology. Your hope is not in alignment with the group that you happen to be a part of. Uh, your hope is Christ in you. Christ in you is your hope of glory. Amen. And Philippians 4 says that he meets all your needs according to the riches and glory. Now, that is not glory off on some distant triangulated place a long way from you. It's he meets all your needs out of the glory that is in you. Hallelujah. And so we need to relate to that glory. Christ in you is your father. Christ in me is just your brother. So the purpose of the prophetic is to usher you into and to connect you with the oracle that is in your own heart and life and the prophetic uh, stream or ministry that does not do that. If all they do is churn out the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, then they, there is a great deficit in their understanding of what they're called to do. Because Ephesians 4 says the prophetic is given for the perfecting of the saints. What does a prophet perfect somebody to do? How to hear from God. And if you think you're called to prophetic office or you think you're connected with a great prophet, the greatness of the prophet is measured by the degree to which he activates your own cap capacity to hear not just the outward oracle, but the inward oracle. Amen. Furthermore, we're going to look at the dimensions of the temple. 
because they speak of the fact that we are in the great finishing season of God's plan for man. Hallelujah. My whole life I've never heard, except in the last several years, this great emphasis on what they call the finishing mm -hmm. anointing. Mm -hmm. Sharon Stone of uh, Christian International is the first time I ever heard anybody say that, that there's a finishing uh, anointing that is in the earth, and we're going to talk about that, what that means for us. So we'll begin by reading 1 Kings 6, lovey-dovey, honey bunny, chinookums, peaches. Those are her ecclesiastical titles yeah, I like peaches. in Father's Heart Ministry, <laughs> verse 1 through... 13. 1 through 13. And it came to pass in the 400 years, in the 80th year, after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziph, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. Second month was Ziph. And the house which the, which King Solomon built for the Lord, the length thereof was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof twenty cubits, and the height thereof thirty cubits. And the porch before the temple of the house, 20 cubits, was the length thereof, according to the breadth of the house, and the 10 cubits was the breadth thereof before the house. And the house he made windows, for the house he made windows of narrow lights. It's interesting to me, we are the temple, but the outward viewpoint, the outward perspective was only through a very narrow light. In other words, he wanted more of an inward focus oh, than an outward perspective. That's awesome, honey. You get that? Awesome, yeah. But otherwise, we would see through our hands or something. Right. You, you know, it if narrow. it was big picture windows, yeah. but he didn't. It's narrow lights. In other words, they'll be looking out there. Mm, keep it Jesus narrow. said they'll say, low here, low there. Let's look, let's look out here. Oh, no. It's wow. on the inside of you. Where do you think Jesus got that? That's right. Because he knew this book better than you and I do. Go ahead. How beautiful that. I never heard it. Uh, verse 5. And against the wall of the house he built chambers round about, against the walls of the house round about, both of the temple and of the oracle, and he made chambers round about. The nethermost chamber was five cubits broad, and the middle was six cubits broad, and the third was seven cubits broad. For without in the wall of the house he made narrow rests round about, that the beam should not be fastened, should not be fastened in the walls of the house. Interesting. And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. Tool of iron. <laughs> what does iron represent? Can you imagine? Judgment. Wow. Human judgmentalism. No sound of iron in my house, says the Father. Wow. What is the biggest criticism both inside and outside the church? They're too judgmental. You know why? It's because we're not doing what Solomon said. Keep your iron implements away from my house. Mm -hmm. We don't want to hear their sound. We don't want to see them. Wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> Okay, uh, verse 8, the door of the middle chamber was in the right side of the house, and they went up with winding stairs into the middle chamber, and out of the middle into the third. So he built the house and finished it, and covered the house with beams and boards of cedar. Then, And then he built the chambers against all the house, five cubits high, and they rested on the house with timber of cedar. And the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this house, which thou art in building, if thou wilt walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then I will perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy father, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Uh, notice what the word of the Lord was. If you will, I will. Mm. Amen. Will do what? I'll perform my word. Now, Jesus endured the contradiction of sinners against himself, and you and I endure contradiction as well. Because every one of us have contradictions to God's promises in your life. You might have a contradiction in your health when he said by his stripes you were healed. You might have contradiction in your finances when he said he became poor so that you could be rich. You might have uh, contradictions in your relationships when it says he was rejected, despised of men so that we would be accepted and walk in the favor of men. We all have contradictions. We can all look and say uh, from the broad scope of Christian culture, there, are there is a great gulf of contradiction, a great gulf 
where we see there is a lack of the performance of the word of God in our lives. Hmm. If we see what he said to Solomon, from whence does that arise? He said, if you will walk in my statutes, if you will execute my judgments, if you will keep all my commandments, and all the Messianic believers are jumping up and down saying, that's right. you got to go to church on Saturday. That's right. you got to keep all this Messianic uh, uh, rules and regulations of Moses' law. No, that's not what it's saying because Galatians says that the purpose of the law was as a tutor to bring man to Christ. The whole point of the commandments is for us to look at the pure commandment of God and collapse exhausted and helpless at the foot of the cross and say, I need a Savior. Amen. How do we keep this? And if we will keep that our lives be a reflection every moment, that the infrastructure of our corporality, the infrastructure of the Christian culture, completely be geared toward making one statement, I can't do this on my own, I need a Savior. Amen. Now, shift gears a moment. Notice what it said. The Temple of Solomon was how many years being constructed? 480 years. All right. Now listen to me. Listen to. We're going to do some hopscotch through time. <laughs> the Temple of Solomon was constructed 480 years after the children of Israel came out of Egypt by Moses. When God appeared to Abraham in Genesis 15, He told him that his descendants would go into captivity for four generations, which actually turned out to be 430 years. Everybody's always talking about how long's a generation. Some say the Bible says it's 20 years. Some say it's 40 years. It plainly says in conversation with Abraham, God plainly says in four generations, and then he repeated it, he said 400 years. A generation in God's eye is 100 years. 100 so I, or 400? It's 100 years. Okay. Four generations, 100 years. Gotcha. 400 years, four generations. Gotcha. And uh, he, he told the, Abraham that his descendants were going to captivity for four generations, which turned out to be 430 years. So 430 years from Abraham to the captivity, 480 years from Moses to the building of the temple, uh, approximately the same span of time. Now, let's go, what about this? Let's look uh, further. The time span between the writing of Malachi and the writing of the Gospels was right at 480 years. Does anybody see a pattern here? 430 years from Abraham to the captivity, 480 years from the captivity to the building of the Temple of Solomon, 480 years from Malachi to the writing of the Gospels, mm -hmm. and then from the birth of Jesus to the establishment of Christianity as the state religion at the Edict of Thessalonica was 380 years. Wow. And then it was 480 years from the Edict of Thessalonica, which you may not think that's important, but that's basically the time when Christianity was no longer persecuted and it became a, they accepted the rule of the ancient world to be a Christian. That's when the Empire of Rome fell uh, exhausted, collapsing at the foot of the cross and saying, we need a savior, and they accepted Christianity. And from the Edict of Thessalonica, in 380 to the crowning of Charlemagne, the king who united uh, Europe, Western Europe under the Christian faith was, guess what, 480 years. 480. Okay. Now, from the crowning of Charlemagne in 800 to John Wycliffe, who wrote the first English Bible, mm -hmm. was... 512 years. How many see a pattern here? From Wycliffe to the first stirrings, if we go from Wycliffe and fast forward 500 years, we find Maria Woodworth Eder mm. being the most well-known gospel minister in the world next to Alexander John Dowie and out of the womb of the holiness movement, the baby of the Pentecostal outpouring was beginning to breach. Mm -hmm. 500 oh, years yes. forward from the time that John Wycliffe made a handwritten copy of the Bible in a manuscript in English. That goes along with what you've taught us about 
it appears that God moves in giant steps in 500 years. That's exactly strides. right. Yeah. Now, if you measure from the year that Luther penned his 99 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Chapel in 517, we are within two years of another 500-year season. Hmm. 517, move forward 500 years, you have 2017. My goodness. Is anybody there? It's exciting. Are you listening? Uh-huh, we're listening. We're with you. We are living in historic times. In our lifespans, even among the very young, we have seen great change, and no doubt this will continue. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was in my 20s, I worked for a man who grew up most of his life on horseback mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, reading by candlelight. And so we'd go up in the warehouse, and when we'd come out of the warehouse, he'd say, blow out the light, son. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'd always chuckle because that was his world. I grew up myself. Uh, you know, I spent time as a young child with my grandparents who did not have indoor plumbing. They did not have, we had an outhouse, we had a well out back. I'd get, how many know what the prime bucket is? I'd get spanked for spilling the prime bucket. I only heard about it. <laughs> and when they talked about getting indoor plumbing, we were all excited. I thought they had toilets and all they did was move the outhouse onto the back porch and they called that indoor, an indoor water closet. Well, it wasn't that at all. Oh, my. And so I remember those times. That, that house still stands. I've showed it to Kitty. Uh, the temple, now let's talk about, let's talk some more about time. And you ju just do a little basic uh, mathematical comprehension here. The temple was three score cubits in length. So that's 60 cubits, but he speaks of it as three score. See, we, I mean, we can break that down into feet and all that, but that doesn't give us the divine message because it was cubits when God spoke this, these things. It was three score cubits in length. And if three score, what would that plus? God's building a temple. He's been building a temple since Adam and Eve. If you divide by 2,000, why would we divide by 2,000? Because it's been 2,000 years since the birth of the church. If you divide recorded history, isn't it interesting that uh, evolutionists insist that the world is aeons old and all this? But go do a little research, and anthropologists will tell you, yes, we believe that human history has been around for all this time, but they will ask them, how long is recorded history? At what point does prehistory begin? And they will say 6,000 years ago. And according to the biblical record, 6,000 years ago Amen. was when God created Adam and Eve. That's right. So if you divide 6,000 years from Adam till now, if you divide 2,000 into that 6,000 years, you get three score millennia. Uh -huh. And the temple was three score cubits in length. Who's listening? Yeah. Thank you for that. It's 20 cubits in depth. And 30 cubits in height. 30 cubits in height, the exact height of Noah's Ark. Wow. And the Ark had three levels. And guess what? If you were listening to what we just read, the temple had three levels. Mm -hmm. And the temple had an Ark within it in a chamber called the Oracle. My goodness. The dimensions in, of, Noah's, of the Ark in Noah's day was 300 by 50 by 30 cubits. We can see that if you look at that, the general shape of the ark and the temple was approximately the same. The ark was much bigger. And again, we pointed out yesterday that the ark, there was 153,000 people involved for seven years building the ark, and it was not much bigger than a tennis court. You, you meant the temple, not the ark. That's right, the That's temple. Right. The temple was... Do you suppose it took so long because there was no hammer, there was no drilling, there was no sawing. It had to be done quietly and yeah. hand hewn. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Think about that. Oh, my. So we can see the general shape of the ark, of Noah's ark and the temple, was the same height. And in fact, it had three levels that were exactly the same. Now, if you take each score, 20 cubits, and attribute it again to a time length of 2,000 years, then the length of the temple matches the time frame of recorded human history and the exact biblical time frame from Eden until now, 6,000 years. 
Mm -hmm. that God has been building something. Amen. The three levels in 30 cubits, the Ark of Noah was 30 cubits high, this temple's 30 cubits high, speak to us of what Jesus referred to in Matthew 13, 33. He was talking about the heart. The heart of man is like a field that seed is sown into, and it produces some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Do you see? Mm -hmm the correlation sure. there's the 30-fold realm that's people come in they get saved they got firehouse religion they're going to heaven when they die and that's all they're ever going to produce mm -hmm. that's the gospel's been sown into their hearts and they got fire escape religion and then there are those who uh, enter into the 30-fold realm but they want to ascend there's got to be something more so they stumble into the 60-fold experience of pentecost and the gifts of the spirit but then there are those that realized that the Pentecostal realm is just the realm of the sons of Keturah. Remember Abraham with his second wife. He sent his, his the sons, eight sons, by his second wife Keturah. He said he gave them gifts and he sent them away. Wow. And some people are content with the gift realm, mm -hmm. the 60-fold realm. Thank you very much. We got miracles. We got tongues. We got prophecy. We're, we're walking in this gift realm, and that's all we want. And they're willing to go away mm -hmm. and be content with the gift realm. But then there are those who say, I don't want, like Song of Solomon said, let him kiss me with the kisses of his lips, for thy love is better than wine. I want a whole lot more than just the gifts. I want the inheritance of Isaac. Amen. I want to enter into the laughter. I want to enter into that which God has for me. I want to walk in the hundredfold realm yes, of sonship yes, Lord. that we have yet to aspire to. We don't have it all yet. We point at cessationists that believe that baptism in the Holy Ghost is not for today. So, oh, no, you don't have it all. They claim they got it all when they signed the little decision card and turned it in uh, at the altar and somebody prayed the sinner's prayer after they read the uh, four spiritual laws tract. Mm -hmm. And the preacher looked at them. They gave their life to Jesus. Now you've been saved, sanctified, baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire, you got it all when you sign that decision card. But we say, no, that's not true. You need Amen. to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Amen. And now we are, who are baptized in the Holy Ghost, uh, we <laughs> believe we got it all, but we don't have it all. Wow. There's another baptism. There, If you look over your spiritual head, there's another level. Amen. There's another 10 cubits in God. <laughs> and he said there was a winding staircase that you would ascend up into that level. Come on. <laughs> Talk about it. And so we want to ascend into that next place Why that God has for us. Why is it winding? Good question. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. So this corresponds to the three promised experiences in God, salvation, baptism in the Holy Ghost, and something we don't have yet, the baptism of fire. Now, if you go ask uh, your, uh, your pastor, whether he's a cessationist or someone that believes in the baptism in the Holy Ghost, he will tell you the baptism of fire is the tribulation and the destruction of the world. Mm. I don't get that. Mm -mm. Baptism of water is pointing at the personal experience of salvation. Baptism of the Holy Ghost is pointing at the personal experience of speaking in tongues. Right. And then all of a sudden, baptism of fire breaks the typology and is pointing at the destruction of the wicked in hellfire at the end nah. of time. Nah. That doesn't make sense, and it's not borne out by the scripture, but we're not teaching on that fully today. Uh, these three experiences are prefigured in the law as the three great feasts of Passover, mm -hmm. salvation, Pentecost, baptism in the Holy Ghost, and tabernacles. Interesting that Peter spoke of our body as our tabernacle. Mm -hmm. That's when our tabernacle, the, what is the baptism of fire? It's when your tabernacle puts on as an experience what your spirit received at salvation, mm -hmm. what your soul received in the baptism in the Holy Ghost, and you receive what some people call body felt salvation, the redemption of the purpose of possession, the adjudication of the saints, the parousia. Some people call it the rapture, but I really question whether we're going anywhere because he said that there will be a sound of a trumpet and we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The Lord's going to descend into the air. We'll be caught up to meet him in the air. And so in the air, 
the implication in the air realm, the second heaven, shall we ever be with the Lord? And when that's talked about in Revelations 12, when it says that happens and the sun clothed woman appears in the second heaven in the air realm, that Satan, the dragon, is cast out of that intermediate realm where angels and demons operate, Jacob's mm -hmm. ladder, mm -hmm. and uh, he's cast out down to the earth. But he's excluded because all of a sudden we're walking around in that second heaven realm where he's been able to get away with things because we couldn't see him or discern him or interfere with him. And all of a sudden we open the door and he's looking us in the face and we pick him up and we eject him from the air realm yes. and he's limited to the earth. Why do you think he has to go get a body called an antichrist, a beast, or a false prophet to get something done? Come on. Because something's changed about what he has access to. Mm -hmm. So we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air as Jesus is going to come down from the third heaven. He's going to come into that second heaven realm and he's going to open the door like he did with John. He just showed John what was happening. He let him look through that door, but he's going to open that door again and he's going to look at you and I and he said, come here. Come here to me. Mm. <laughs> and we're going to step yes. into that realm. And that's what most people are looking at when they talk about the parousia or the rapture. Glory to God. That's about 30 years of, uh, uh, of eschatological inquiry wrapped up in about five minutes of conversation. Are you still breathing? Yep. I didn't even give you a chance to put Not on your snorkel breathe. gear. No, but they said they got a whole meal, meaty meal with all the trimmings and dessert too in that statement. <laughs> so thus, in the <laughs> temple dimensions, we see the scope <clears throat> of salvation and the timeline of God's purposes from Eden until now. Yes. And this all points to the day we live in as a time when the temple of God that he has been building into man is coming to its completion in this season in history. Mm -hmm. Amen. I'm God stepping through time in 500 year strides. I'm glad we're around to see it. In the building of the temple, there was no sound of tool or hammer or iron implements on the temple site. All of this had to be finished before. And notice that even then, judgment. What was the, if the iron represents judgment, what was the purpose of judgment? Preparing building materials. That's not what the judgmental in the church does. Come on. Judgmentalism in the church is not to prepare anybody. It's to destroy lives. That's right. And if you've ever been a recipient of that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There is no redemp nothing redemptive about the judgmentalism that is in the church. Yeah. But rather it should be the fivefold ministry that's supposed to build up the saints for the work of the ministry. Well, the scripture dead. says, Paul made a statement. He said, uh, uh, he said, magistrates judge those who are without. How come you're not judging those who are within? And people quote that. I have a right to judge. Paul told me to. Yes, you, but your judgment is about working on the lively stones that Jesus died for, that Jesus queried out of the earth by the, his death, burial, resurrection, and suffering, and you better handle them with care because he died for them. And your judgment is to query people, to see them shaped discipled and fashioned that they might be suitably fitted into the purposes of God, not ejected out into some man-made religious Gehenna where they can never be redeemed from. Come on now. That's a good truth, hon. See, the temple that you are is not a work of man. It's a work of God. Iron is a type of judgment, specifically in this place, the judgment of man. If you're going to be a lively stone in this house or a stonemason, I'm an apostle. That's what I do. I judge people. Mm -hmm. You are doing, that's an illegitimate authority. Mm -hmm. And people, yes, I believe that apostles have a responsibility to reprove, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. But you better be careful taking your implements to God's people because I've seen apostles in 10 seconds mm -hmm. devastate someone for a lifetime. That's right. By their <laughs> flippant, dismissive, casual, autocratic attitude. And we need to try those who say they are apostles and are not and find them liars. And when they come walking onto the site of God's temple with their tool belt, we need to eject them right out the door and put them back on the plane and send them home. Amen to that. I know that's not popular. Mm -hmm. And apostles don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. But until you're walking in power, raising the dead, until you have the signs of an apostle in your life, don't begin to demand upon the people of God to align with your gifting whenever it is immature, unfinished, 
unsanctified until you see an apostle who gets in the flesh, he's a sorcerer. That's right. A prophet in the flesh, he's a wizard. He peeps and mutters. Not good. We're not going to spend any more time on that. <laughs> see, 2015 is the year of the apostle, the Lord told me last year. Mm -hmm. This is the year that apostolic fiction begins to become apostolic substance. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people out there seeing themselves as apostles that they may have a call, but they're not demonstrating robust apostolic, mature, robust apostolic initiative. And we need to realize that. They're demanding apostolic uh, alignment. Mm -hmm. They're demanding apostolic respect, but they're not walking in apostolic substance. Yeah, they don't have the stuff. Amen. They're not there yet. And they're not fit to be <coughs> submitted to until they come into the fullness of their calling. And if, they can't, if you can't claim to be an apostle and you can't receive rebuke, then you are not suited to give rebuke mm -hmm. because you're not a father. You haven't gone through your spiritual puberty yet. A lot of meat in this dish today, honey. <laughs> a lot of meat. See, the Lord told me this morning that prophets build within, apostles build without. Mm -hmm. I'm not even Makes sure sense. what that means, but God told me this morning well, while I was praying. Let's do on it. <laughs> the word of the Lord came to Solomon during the construction of the temple, that if he would be faithful in the midst of the building, that God would perform his word. Now let the scripture interpret scripture. Do we see the word of God not being performed in our midst? Of course we do. Are there contradictions in Christian experience from the clear promise of scripture? Of course we do. If God said, I, I will heal all your diseases and all our diseases are not healed, is it because of some obscure vagary of God's sovereignty, as the theologians suggest, because they want to let themselves off the hook? Or is it because perhaps we as a people have not been faithful as God exhorted Solomon? Well, I've been faithful, yes, but we are connected to an unfaithful corpus, a corporeality of God. We are a part of a nation, just like there were many faithful uh, Germans in Nazi Germany, but they suffered because of the nation they were a part of. And likewise, there is suffering that the people of God go through because we are a, a nation. Whether we're a holy nation or not, we are a nation. Mm -hmm. And there are consequences because of our connection. But we can begin to see a change as we stand up and say, ain't nothing wrong, but something ain't right. Mm -hmm. Like one man said, verse 14 through <coughs> 28. Pardon me. Verse 14. So Solomon built the house and finished it. And he built the walls of the house within with boards of cedar, both the floor of the house and the walls of the ceiling. And he covered them on the inside with wood and covered the floor of the house with planks of fir. And he built 20 cubits on the side of the house, both the floor and the walls with boards of cedar. And he even built them for it within, even for the oracle, even for the most holy place. And the house, that is, the temple before it, was 40 cubits long. And the cedars of the house within was carved with knops and open flowers. All was cedar. There was no stone seen. What the heck is a knop? We're um, going to talk about that. Yeah. And the oracle he prepared within the house, so there, um, s to set there the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And the oracle in the forepart was twenty cubits in length and twenty cubits breadth, twenty cubits high thereof. And he overlaid it with pure gold and covered the altar which was of cedar. So Solomon overlaid the house within the with with pure gold, and he made the partition by the chains of gold before the oracle, and he overlaid it with gold. And the whole house he overlaid with gold until he A had... A tennis court <laughs> overlaid with gold. Hello. Hallelujah. Until he had finished all the house. Also the whole altar was by the, by the oracle he overlaid with gold. And within the oracle he made two cherubim of olive tree, each ten cubits high. And five cubits was the one wing of the cherub, and five cubits the other wing of the cherub, from the uttermost part to the one wing, unto the uttermost part of the other were ten cubits. Through 25? Uh, 28. I'm sorry. And the other uh, cherub was ten cubits. Both the cherubim were of one measure and one size. And the height of one cherub was ten cubits, and so it was of the other cherub. <clears throat> and he set the cherubim within the inner house, and they stretched forth the wings of the cherubim, so that the wing 
of one touched one wall, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall, and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. And he overlaid the cherubims with gold, more gold. The cherubims were crafted of olive wood, mm -hmm. which is olive trees <coughs> represent the anointing. The wood represents humanity. When you see the cherubim, it implies that the angels are tasked with the, the oversight and ministration to anointed humanity. And I want you to notice that the wings of these cherubim mm -hmm. representing different anointings were touching one another. Mm -hmm. There has to be a touching, a Amen. connection of anointing <clears throat> with anointing. Think about that. That's what we've looked for all of these years. And what does the enemy yeah. work so hard to do? To keep the anointing sequestered from one another, isolated from one another, mm. separated from one another. We don't want those cherubim's wings touching because something happens when they mm. do. Mm. And so he isolates your pastor and he isolates the prophet and he isolates the apostle. But it's time for us to, in our anointed humanity, allow the cherubim's wings that are overshadowing us to touch one another without some fear that we're going to lose something of value to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not be so territorial that we quench the Spirit of God. The Holy Place was referred to as the Oracle. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was placed. The Ark of the Covenant was where God fixed His presence among the people. It represents the glory of God, the indwelling of Christ in our hearts. What the Ark prefigures is who Jesus is on the inside of you. Before we consult any outward oracle, we should consult and seek the inward oracle Amen. of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. Then, remember Matthew 18, if any two of you agree, what two are you talking about? Just any two? Look, how many times you took somebody's hand and say, we agree, and nothing happened? Because you're not getting it. He's talking about the inward oracle agreeing with the outward oracle and the heavens open and everything you say and do becomes as effective as if he said it or did it. Let's have that, Father. Let's have that. When the inward oracle and the outward oracle agree, nothing shall be impossible. Mm. The oracle was decorated with open flowers and knops. What the heck is a knop? You told us in one of the other chapters. And a cherubim. The flat, well, then those were almond knops. This is something a little different. Okay. It's a different word. Uh, flowers speak of the aroma of God's presence. Mm -hmm. I heard somebody say something this morning. Didn't sound right to me. And, and they were just speaking extemporaneously, and I think if they thought about it, they wouldn't have said it. They said God's power is more important than his presence. Uh-uh. And I'm like, no, he wasn't thinking about no that. Way. He wasn't thinking about that when he said it because mm -hmm. he's an anointed man of God that I respect, and he moves in a higher realm of this than we do. Mm -hmm. But something there. What is a knop? The word knop here is pika. Now listen, this really excited me. This is the gem of this entire chapter, and the whole <laughs> thing's good. It's all good. It means to burst. To burst. Think about it. Burst as in breakthrough. Suddenly. You know, I got it in my heart to do a teaching, a series of teachings on breakout, breakthrough, Break in. Amen. To burst. You realize God decorated the oracle in Solomon's temple, the Holy of Holies. He decorated it with a symbol that represents breakthrough. I hear people, I've heard, seen people uh, on the internet and other places, they despise that word breakthrough. Yeah, hey, yeah, I was talking about breakthrough. Breakthrough this, breakthrough that. <laughs> and now, hold on a minute. Yeah. God, the eternal God, decorated the Holy of Holies where he put the Ark of the Covenant that Harrison Ford found, remember? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Indiana Jones. Uh, he decorated the room with a symbol of breakthrough. Wow. It, it, it's, and it was actually what it looked like was an egg, like an ornamental egg, mm -hmm. or a gourd. That is God's way of saying, in here, in this oracle, is where breakthrough or bursting through. I just need to get to that meeting so I can have a breakthrough. I don't know. The breakthrough is in the inward oracle. Mm -hmm. The outward oracle only comes into alignment or agreement 
with the inward oracle and it is the inward oracle where the breakthrough is initiated folks the breakthrough that you're seeking is not going to come through any outward uh, by originating in something outward you get exposed to the only uh, value of the outward oracle is that it comes and activates your focus or your attention on the inward oracle where the true breakthrough will manifest that will change your life because remember the glory is in you and he meets your needs out of the glory Amen. we need to open that up and he uses the prophetic to do it mm. let's keep going the cherubim in Solomon's temple were made of olive wood overlaid with gold we talked about that olive trees produce olive oil a type of anointing thus we see an intrinsic connection of the angelic with the anointing see the devil's not after you he's after the anointing in you amen the angels are not interested in you they're interested in the anointing on you why do you think every time an angel gets around God he says holy 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 Lord God Almighty because he's pushing into the glory you may see angels as guarding you personally and certainly they do but more importantly they are custodians and servants of the anointing of God wherever they find it so you better get the anointing in you come on <laughs> verse 29 through 38 and he carved uh, all the walls of the house round about with carved figures of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers within and without and the floor of the house he overlaid with gold within and without and for the entering of the oracle, he made doors of olive tree, the lentil, and side posts were a fifth part of the wall. The two doors were also of olive tree, and he carved upon them carvings of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers, and over they laid them with gold and spread gold upon the cherubim and upon the palm trees. So also he made for the door of the temple posts of olive tree, a fourth part of the wall. And two doors uh, were of fir tree and two leaves of one door were folding and two leaves of the other door were folding and he carved thereon cherubim and palm tree and opened the flowers and covered them with gold fitted upon the carved work and he built the inner court with three rows of hewed stone and a row of cedar beams in the fourth year was the foundation of the house of the Lord laid in Mount Ziph and in the eleventh year in the Mount Bull which is the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all the parts thereof, and according to all the fashion of it, so it, so was he seven years in building it. So the, now let's talk about the doors. How do we enter the oracle? The doors for entering the oracle, the entrance to the Holy of Holies. You've got an oracle in you. How do you Jesus. get access to it? It represents Jesus. They were made of olive tree overlaid with gold. Mm -hmm. The gold represents the divine nature of God. Yes. It's interesting they were those doors were overlaid with palm trees. Palm trees represent the prophetic. You see what I've been saying to you is that the purpose of the prophetic is to give you that inward focus to the resource of who God is in you. Mm -hmm. God is saying, prophet, yeah. this is your job. It's not about people becoming outwardly dependent upon the prophet but about the prophet speaking the word to people and pointing them and activating in them that inward resource so that the oracle within and the oracle without agree, creating an open heaven over your life. Mm -hmm. Deborah prophesied under the palm trees, did she Absolutely. not? Mm -hmm. The prophetic is the only, uh, one thing I love about the prophetic, the prophetic is the only fivefold ministry that Jesus said you should support financially. Wow. He didn't say not to support the others. I'm just pointing out, if I may, because <laughs> I'm in the prophetic ministry, that the fivefold ministry is the, uh, the, the prophet is the only one of the fivefold ministries that he specifically said you'll get a reward if you support him. Now, mm -hmm. he implied you'd be a reward. I'm not saying don't give to the others. Of course. I'm just... Yeah. I'm just saying. Just saying, <laughs> Prophet Russ. <laughs> the prophetic is the only fivefold ministry gifting associated with the types and shadows of Solomon's temple. Right. The prophet, right on the door. Hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. I'm just saying. Yeah. Listen to what I'm saying, what I'm not saying. Thank you, Lord. They decorated the door 
to the oracle made of olive wood. The purpose of the prophetic is to give you an inward opening and access to all that God is on the inside of you. And the prophet who isn't doing that is not doing his job. Right. The prophet's job is to enlarge and amplify and increase your understanding, connection, and interaction with Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if the prophet doesn't do that, if all he is is churning out prophetic words or creating an outward dependency where you just don't see how you could ever make it without connect. No, you have to grow up into him, and him is not a man, but it's who Jesus is on the inside of you. And every true, mature prophet gets that. Amen and is willing for you to stand on his shoulders and grow into the fullness of God in your life. Mm -hmm. And a lot of prophets don't get that. Right. We're praying that they do. Amen. If you know one, you, you send him to me, I'll help him. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Olive trees produce oil and represent the anointing. Wood in the Bible speaks of man and his humanity. Jesus was the Christ, the anointed one, and he is the door of salvation. We enter into the holiest place, into God's Shekinah presence, through the anointed man. Now, I'm so glad those doors were not of solid gold. Mm -hmm. Because if the doors were of solid gold, then it would say only uh, through just who God was. But it was not just through who God was, but it was God in man, in the man Christ Jesus. In other words, if you don't have an understanding of the humanity of Jesus, in the first century they struggled to believe he was God because they saw him in his humanity. Mm -hmm. We struggle to allow him to be a man because that's, we only know him in his divinity in mm -hmm. our day. But you have, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You must allow him to be fully man and fully God. You realize that he was born once of Mary. This will help you. He was born once of Mary right? Mm -hmm. And the Bible also called him the first begotten from the dead, right? Mm -hmm. So he was born in Mary, then he was born from the dead. Right. You get it? What happened after he was first begotten from the dead? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, born once of Mary, born again. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm saying, what I'm not saying. When he was first begotten from the dead, that means there's a born-again man sitting at the right hand of the Father, and his name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, I know there's a teaching out there that, you know, did Jesus die spiritually? I'm not even getting into that. Okay, that's, I, 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 those people that have that argument on both sides of it, they're both wrong, because the reason they don't have the right answers is because they're not asking the right questions. And if they get the right questions, then they would realize that God is looking at that from a whole other perspective. But I'm just pointing out to you, all I'm saying is he was born to Mary once. He was born from the dead, the first begotten from the dead. That means he's a born again man. He's still a man. So there's a born again man called Christ Jesus sitting at the right hand of the father, the head of the church. Gets you, doesn't it? It's like, Amen. <laughs> but you got to let him be man. See, he's the door, but the door represents both his divinity and his humanity, and you have to let him be both, or your access is impeded. Amen. And a master plan. Just saying. Amen. See, the anointing is the key to entering into all that God has for us. Doctrine does not bring us into God's presence. <laughs> Correct theology doesn't put us under an open heaven. It is the anointing, the oil that is poured out upon all flesh, as Joel 2.28 speaks of, that brings us into the center of what God has for us in relationship to himself. Now, the temple was seven years in building, back to the timing issue. In the seventh year, the building ceased, just as in the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And this is the seventh year. We are now in the seventh 1,000-year day from Adam. Amen. So says Second Peter 3, 8, that a 1,000 years is as a day, and a day is as a 1,000 years. See, the millennia that you and I are now in is the seventh day millennium from creation. We are in the day that God's going to do a finishing thing. He's going to rest from his labors. He's going to finish this temple that he's been building all this time, all three levels. 
Salvation, baptism in the Holy Ghost, baptism of fire, mm -hmm. salvation of your spirit, sanctification of your soul, and a redemption of the purchased possession of your physical body. Amen. It's a time of finishing and of coming into the rest of God, in God's larger and broader purposes is, that you and I are intrinsically a part of. God chose that. Now the exciting part is, is God chose that you and I would be born in this generation and would be partakers of the finishing of this great corporate temple of which you and I are a part. I would not trade places with Peter. No. I would not trade places with Moses. I wouldn't trade places with Adam because God chose that you and I would be a part of this day. The seventh day when God will rest from all his works and do a finishing work of this temple of humanity he's been building for all this time. Hallelujah. Thank Amen. you, Jesus. Thank you, so it's an exciting time. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the similitude, typology, metaphor, shadow of what we see in these things that are communicated that all has meaning. God, you could probably write a thousand books on these subjects mm -hmm. but we thank you that we can just glimpse in and know god we're not going to be spending all our time looking out those narrow outward windows god mm -hmm. we want to look on the inward glory mm -hmm. you didn't want our attention on the outward things you wanted our attention on the inward glory father god and that's where we have turned today to rejoice about who you are in us yes. and i pray that this become a reality let it become a living reality let every person listening god go out in their day with a sense that i have an ark inside me it's called my heart i have an oracle inside me that i can consult i have something on side inside me that's meant to activate and create an open heaven yes. and it's the man christ jesus thank, thank you for it father in jesus name amen